considering that I have a cold right now, I can't imagine a more appropriate topic to make a video on than a virus. I want to make it that thick. A virus or viruses. Viruses. And in my opinion, viruses are on some level the most fascinating thing in all of biology because they, they really blur the boundary between what is an inanimate object and what is life. What is life? I mean, if we look at ourselves or, you know, life is one of those things that you know it when you see it. If you see something that it, it's born, it grows, it, it's constantly changing, maybe it moves around, maybe it doesn't, but it's metabolizing things around itself, it reproduces and then it dies, you say, hey, that's probably life. And in this, we throw most things that we see or, you know, we throw in us, we throw in bacteria, we throw in plants. I mean, I could, I could, I'm kind of butchering the taxonomy system here, but we, we tend to know life when we see it. But all viruses are, they're, they're just a bunch of genetic information inside of a protein, inside of a protein capsule. So let me, let me draw. So let's say, and it can, the genetic information can come in any form. So it can be, you know, it could be an RNA, it could be DNA, it could be single-stranded RNA, double-stranded RNA. Sometimes they'll write, you know, for single-stranded, they'll write these two S's in front of it. Uh, for, say they're talking about double-stranded DNA, they'll put a DS in front of it. But the general idea, and viruses can come in all of these forms, is that they have some genetic information, some nucleo, some chain of nucleic acids, either as single or double-stranded RNA or single or double-stranded DNA. And it's just in, contained inside some type of protein structure, which is called a capsid. And kind of the classic, the classic drawing is kind of an I, isosahedron type looking thing. Let me see if I can do justice to it. It looks something like this. And not all viruses have to look exactly like this. There's thousands of types of viruses, and we're really just scratching the surface and understanding even what viruses out there and all of the different ways that they can uh, essentially get, kind of replicate themselves. And we'll talk more about that in the future. And I, and I would suspect that pretty much any possible way of replication probably does somehow exist in the virus world. But they really are just these proteins. These protein capsules are just made up of a bunch of little proteins put together. And inside, they have some genetic material, which might be DNA or might be RNA. So let me draw their genetic material. You know, the protein's not necessarily transparent, but if it was, you would see, you would see some genetic material inside of there. And so the question is, is this, is this thing life? It seems pretty inanimate. It doesn't grow. It doesn't change. It doesn't metabolize things. This thing left to its own devices is just going to sit there. It's just going to sit there the way um, a book on a table just sits there. It doesn't. It won't change anything. But what happens is, uh, I guess, the, the debate arises. I mean, you might say, hey, Sal, when you define it that way, it just looks like a bunch of molecules put together. That isn't life. But it starts to seem like life all of a sudden when it comes in contact with the things that we normally consider life. So what viruses do, the classic, the classic example is a virus will attach itself to a cell. So let's let me draw this thing a little bit smaller. So let's say that this is my virus. I'll draw it as a little hexagon. And what it does is it'll attach itself to a cell. It could be any type of cell. It could be a bacteria cell. It could be a, a plant cell. It could be a human cell. Let me draw the cell here. The cells are usually far larger than the virus. In the case of cells that have soft membranes, the virus figures out some way to enter it. Sometimes it can essentially uh, fuse. It, so I'll, I don't want to. I don't want to complicate the issue, but sometimes viruses have their own little membranes, and we'll talk about in a second where it gets their membranes. So a virus might have its own membrane like that that's around its capsid, and then these membranes will fuse, and then the virus will be able to enter into the cell. Now that's one method, another method, and they're seldom all the same way, but let's say another method would be the virus convinces just by based on some protein receptors on it or protein receptors on the cells. And obviously this has to be kind of a Trojan horse type of thing. The cell doesn't want viruses, so the virus has to somehow convince the cell that it's a non-foreign particle. That, we, could do a, we could do hundreds of videos on how viruses work, and it's a continuing field of research, but sometimes you might have a virus that just gets consumed by the cell. Maybe the cell just thinks it's something that it needs to consume. So the cell wraps around it like this. The cell will wrap around it like this, and these sides will eventually merge, and then the cell and the virus will go into it. This is called endocytosis. I'll just talk about this. It just brings it into its cytoplasm. It doesn't happen just endocytosis. It doesn't happen just to viruses, but this is one mechanism that can enter. And then in cases where the, where the cell in question, for example, in the situation with bacteria, if the cell has a very hard shell, if the cell is, let me do it in good color. So let's say that this is a bacteria right here. It has a hard shell. The viruses don't even enter the cell. They just hang out outside of the cell like this not drawn to scale, and they actually inject their genetic material. So there's obviously a huge, there's a wide variety of ways of how the viruses get into the cell, but that's beside the point. The interesting thing is that they do get into the cell, and once they do get into the cell, they release their genetic material into the cell. So the genetic material will float around. If the genetic material is uh, already in the form of RNA, and you know, this almost, I can imagine almost every possibility of, of different ways for viruses to work probably do exist in nature, we just haven't found them. But the ones that we've already found really do kind of uh, do it in every possible way. So if, if they have RNA, this RNA can immediately, can immediately start being used to, and essentially let's say this is the nucleus of the cell, that's the nucleus of the cell, and it normally has the DNA in it like that. Maybe I'll do the DNA a different color. But DNA, DNA gets, uh, gets, tran gets transcribed into RNA normally. So normally the cell is a normal working cell. The RNA exits the nucleus. It goes to the ribosomes. And then you have the RNA in conjunction with the tRNA. And it produces these proteins, right? Proteins, the RNA codes for different proteins. And I talk about that in the, in the different videos. So these proteins get formed, and eventually uh, you know, they can form the different structures in a cell. But what a virus does is it hijacks this process here. It hijacks this mechanism. This RNA will essentially go and do what the cell's own RNA would have done, and it starts coding for its own proteins. Obviously, it's not going to code for the same things there. And actually, some of the first proteins it codes for often start killing the DNA and the RNA that might otherwise compete with it. So it codes its own proteins, and then those proteins start making more viral shells. So those proteins just start constructing more and more viral shells. And at the same time, this RNA is replicating. It's using the, the cell's own mechanisms. Left to its own devices, it would just sit there. But once it enters into a cell, it can use all of the nice machinery that a cell has around to replicate itself. And then, I mean, it's kind of amazing, just with just the, the biochemistry of it, that these, that these RNA molecules can find themselves back in these capsids. And then once there's enough of these, and the, the cell has essentially all of its resources have been depleted, the viruses, these, these individual new viruses that have replicated themselves using all of the, all of the, the, the cell's mechanisms will find some way to exit the cell. The, the kind of the most, I don't want to say typical because we haven't even discovered all the different types of viruses there are, but one that's, I guess, talked about the most is that when there's enough of these, they'll release proteins or they'll construct proteins because they don't make their own that essentially cause the cell to either kill itself or its membrane to dissolve. So the membrane dissolves, 
and essentially the cell lyses. Let me write that down. The cell lyses. And lysis just means that the cell's membrane just disappears, and then all of these guys can emerge from the cell. Now, I talked about before that you, know, you have some of these guys that they have their own membranes. So how did they get there, you know, these, these kind of bilipid membranes? Well, some of them, what they do is, once they replicate inside of a cell, once they replicate inside of a cell, they exit maybe not even killing, they don't have to lice. You know, everything I talk about, these are specific ways that a virus might work, but viruses really kind of explore, every, well, the different types of viruses do almost every different combination you can imagine of replicating and, uh, and, and, and coding for proteins and then escaping from cells. Some of them just bud. And when they bud, they essentially, you can kind of imagine that they push against the cell wall, or the membrane, I shouldn't say cell wall, the, the cell's outer membrane. And then when they push against it, they take some of the membrane with them. And so eventually the cell will, you know, when this goes up enough, this will pop together, and it'll take some of the membrane with it. And you can, you can imagine why that would be a useful thing to have with you. Because now that you have this membrane, you kind of look like this cell. So when you want to go infect another cell like this, it's, you're not going to necessarily look like a foreign particle. So it's a very useful way to kind of um, look like something that you're not. And if you didn't, if you don't think that this is creepy crawly enough, that you know you're hijacking the DNA of an organism, cells can actually change. Viruses can actually change the DNA of an organism. And, and actually, one of the most common examples is HIV virus. Let me write that down. HIV, which is a type of retrovirus, retrovirus, which is fascinating because what they do is, so they have RNA in them. They have RNA in them, and when they enter into a cell, let's say that they got into the cell, so it's inside of the cell like this. They, they, they actually bring along with them a protein. And you, you know, every time you say, where did they get this protein came? All of this stuff came from a different cell. They used some other cells, amino acids and ribosomes and, and nucleic acids and everything to build themselves. And so any proteins that they have in them came from another cell. But they use this, they bring with them this protein reverse transcriptase. And the reverse transcriptase takes their RNA and codes it, and codes it into DNA. So it's RNA to DNA, which when it was first discovered was, you know, kind of, people always thought that you always went from DNA to RNA, but this kind of broke that paradigm. But it codes from RNA to DNA, and if that's not bad enough, it'll incorporate, it'll incorporate that DNA into the DNA of the host cell. So that DNA, if this was, that DNA will incorporate itself to the DNA of the host, let's say the yellow is the DNA of the host cell, and this is its nucleus. So it actually messes with the genetic makeup of what it's infecting. And, you know, when I made the videos on bacteria, I said, hey, you know, we're, we have, for every one human cell, we have 20 bacteria cell, and they live with us, and they're useful, and they're part of us, and they're 10% of our dry mass and all of that. But bacteria are kind of along for the ride. They don't change who we are. But these retroviruses, they're actually changing our genetic makeup. I mean, I, my genes I take very personally. They define who I am. But these, these guys will actually go in and change my genetic makeup. And then once they're part of the DNA, then just the natural DNA to RNA to, to protein process will code will code their actual proteins or their, what they need to, so, so, you know, sometimes they'll lay dormant and do nothing, and sometimes, once they, you know, sometimes it's some type of environmental trigger, they'll start coding for themselves again, and they'll start producing more, but they're producing it directly from the organisms, from the cell's DNA, they become part of the organism, I mean, I can't imagine a more um, intimate way to become part of an organism than to become part of its DNA, I can't imagine any other way to actually define an organism, and if this, if this by itself is not eerie enough, and, and just so you know, this, this notion right here, when a virus becomes part of an organism's DNA, this is called a provirus, pro virus. But if this isn't eerie enough, they estimate, so, you know, if this just, if this infects a cell in my, I don't know, in my nose or in my arm, it'll, it, you know, as the cell experiences mitosis, all of its, its offspring, but its offspring are genetic identical, are going to have this viral DNA. And that might be fine, but at least my children won't get it, you know, at least it won't become part of my species. But it doesn't have to just infect somatic cells, it could infect a germ cell. So it could, it could go into a germ cell. And the germ cells, we've learned already, these are the ones that produce gametes. For men, it's sperm, and for women, it's egg, eggs. But you can imagine, once you've infected a germ cell, once you become part of a germ cell's DNA, then I'm passing on that viral DNA to my son or my daughter, and he, they're going to pass it on to their children. And, you know, just that idea by itself is, is, is at least in my mind, uh, vaguely creepy. And people estimate that 5 to 8%, and this kind of really blurs, you know, it, it makes you think about what we as humans really are, but the estimate is 5 to 8% of the human genome of human genome. So when I talked about bacteria, I just talk, talked about things that were along for the ride. But the, the current estimate, and I looked up this a lot, I found 8% someplace, 5% someplace, it's all a guess. I mean, people are doing it based on just looking at the DNA and how similar it is to DNA in other organisms. But the estimate is 5 to 8% of the human genome is from viruses, is from like, ancient retroviruses that incorporated themselves into the, into the human germline, so into, into human DNA. So these are called endogenous retroviruses. Endogenous retroviruses. Which is mind-blowing to me, because it's not just saying these things are along for the ride or that they might help us or hurt us. It's saying that we are, our 5 to 8% of our DNA actually comes from viruses. And this is another thing that speaks to just genetic variation, because viruses do something, I mean, this, you can, this is called, you know, I guess you call it a horizontal transfer of DNA. Because you can imagine as a virus goes from one species to the next, as it goes from, you know, species A to B, if it, if it mutates to be able to infiltrate B's cells, it might take some, but it'll take the DNA that it has, that it already, that makes it, it with it. But sometimes when it starts coding for some of these other guys, so let's say that this is a provirus right here, where this is the blue part is the original virus, the yellow is the, is the organism's, I guess, historic DNA. Sometimes when it codes, it takes up little sections of the other organism's DNA. So, you know, maybe most of it was the viral DNA, but it might have, when it transcribed and translated itself, it might have taken a little bit, or at least when it translated or replicated itself, it might take a little bit of the organism's previous DNA. So it's actually cutting parts of DNA from one organism and bringing it to another organism, taking it from one member of a species to another member of a species. But it can definitely go cross species. So you have this idea of all of a sudden that DNA can jump between species. And it really kind of, I don't know, for me, it makes me appreciate how interconnected, you know, we, as species, we kind of imagine that we're by ourselves and we can only reproduce with each other and have a genetic variation within a population. But viruses introduce this notion of horizontal transfer via transduction. And trans transfer. Horizontal transduction is just the idea of, look, when I when I replicate this virus, I might take a little bit of the, the organism that I'm using, that I'm kind of freeloading off of, I might take a little bit of their DNA with me and infect that DNA into the next organism. So you actually have this DNA that's jumping from organism to organism. So it kind of unifies all, you know, all like it's a DNA-based life, which is all the life that we know on, on the planet.
And if all of this, uh, all of this isn't creepy enough, and actually maybe I didn't, I'll, I'll save the creepiest part for the end. But there's a whole, you know, we could talk all about the different classes of viruses. But just so that you're familiar with some of the terminology, when a virus, when a virus attacks bacteria, which they often do, and we study these often the most because this might be a, a good alternative to antibiotics, because viruses that attack the bacteria might, you know, sometimes the bacteria is far worse for the virus. But these are called bacteriophages. Bacteriophages. And I've already talked to you about, you know, they have their DNA, but since bacteria have hard walls, they'll just inject the DNA inside of the bacteria. And, you know, when you talk about, when you talk about DNA, this idea of kind of a provirus. So when, when a virus, you know, lyses it like this, it's called the lytic cycle. This is just some terminology that's good to know if you're going to take a biology exam about this stuff. And when the virus incorporates it into the DNA and lays dormant, it incorporates it into the DNA of the host organism and lays dormant for a while, this is called the lysogenic cycle. And normally, although, you know, a provirus is essentially experiencing a lysogenic cycle in eukaryotes and, and organisms that's, that, that have a, a, a nuclear membrane, normally when people talk about the lysogenic cycle, they're talking about viral DNA laying dormant in the DNA of bacteria or bacteriophage DNA laying dormant in the, in the DNA of bacteria. But just to kind of give you an idea of what this quote unquote looks like, what this looks like right here, I, I got these two pictures from Wikipedia, one is from the CDC. This is actually, so this is these little green dots, and this was colored, I think the original picture was in black and white. These little green dots you see right all over the surface. This, this big thing you see here, this is a white blood cell. This is a white blood cell, part of the human immune system. So this is a white blood cell, white blood cell. And what you see emerging from the surface, essentially budding from the surface of this white blood cell, and this gives you a sense of scale too, these are HIV-1 viruses. And just so you're, you're familiar, and this is why, uh, so, so you're familiar with the terminology, the, uh, the HIV is the virus that it infects, I guess you could call it, infects white blood cells. AIDS is the syndrome you get once your immune system is weakened to the point, and, and then many people, you know, they suffer infections that people with a strong immune system uh, normally won't suffer from. But this is creepy. I mean, these things went inside this huge cell. They used the cell's own or mechanism to reproduce its own DNA or its own RNA and these protein capsids, and then they bud from the cell and they take a little bit of the membrane with it. And they can even leave some of their DNA behind in this cell's own DNA. So they really change what the cell is all about. This is another creepy picture. These right here are bacteriophages. These are bacteriophages. Bacteriophages. And these show you what I said before. This is a bacteria right here. This is this is its cell wall, and it's hard, so it's hard to just kind of uh, just emerge into it, or you can't just merge fuse membranes with it. So they hang out on the outside. They hang out on the outside of this bacteria, and they're essentially injecting their, de their genetic material into it, into the bacteria itself. And you can imagine just looking at the size of these things. I mean, this is a cell, and it looks like a whole planet or something, or not, you know, or this is a bacteria, and these things are so much smaller, roughly one hundredth of a bacteria, and these are much less than one hundredth of this cell we're talking about. They're extremely hard to kind of to, to, to filter for, to, to kind of keep out, because they, they are such such small particles. But you know, just if you think that you know, these are only exotic things that exist for things like you know a HIV or or Ebola, which which they do cause, or SARS, you're right. But they are also common things. I mean, I said at the beginning of this video that I have a cold, and I have a cold because some viruses have infected the tissue in my in my nasal passage, and they're causing me to you know have a runny nose and whatnot. Um, and you know, viruses also cause the chicken pox. They cause the herpes simplex virus causes cold sores. So they're, they're with all around you I, I can almost guarantee you have some virus with you uh, as you speak they're all around you but they can but it's, it's just a very uh, you know it's, it's a very um a, a philosophically puzzling question because i started with at the beginning you know are these life and at first when i just uh, showed it to you is it, look they're just this you know protein with some nucleic acid molecule in it and it's not doing anything and that doesn't look like life to me it's not moving around it doesn't have a metabolism it's not eating it's not reproducing but then all of a sudden you think about what it's doing to cells and how it uses cells to kind of reproduce it's kind of like you know in a business terms it's asset light it doesn't need all of the machinery because it can use other people's machinery to replicate itself it's almost you almost kind of want to view it as a a, a smarter form of life because it doesn't, it doesn't go through all of the trouble of what you know every other form of life has and it, it, it makes you question what life is or even what we are you know are we these things that contain dna or are we just are we just transport mechanisms for the, the dna and these are kind of the more important things and you know these viral infections are just battles between different forms of dna and rna and whatnot anyway i don't want to get too philosophical on you but uh, i hopefully this gives you a good idea of, of what viruses are and, and what why they really are in my mind the most fascinating pseudo organism in all of biology in my most